passion continues. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for this lunchtime uh, discussion. My name's Champa Patel, I'm the head of the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us here today uh, as we launch our Pacific series. So for those of you who are familiar with Chatham House, it's had an Asia program for a very, very long time, but this year we took the decision to expand our work to cover the Pacific space as well, because we feel this is strategically important in terms of inter international relations. So what we'll be doing today as part of a series of events this week in partnership with the New Zealand government is looking at different aspects of the Pacific space. So what we want to do today is have a discussion around strategic contestation in the Pacific. And this is partly because the US administration is now very much talking about the Indo-Pacific space. The UK has said that it's going to establish three diplomatic posts in the region. And it's clearly an, a, a language that's starting to have greater currency. But what does it actually mean? And what does it mean from the perspective of those from within the region? So joining us today for this discussion, we have uh, Cleo Pascal, who's an associate fellow with the Asia Pacific Program, and also with the, uh, our Energy, Environment and Resources Department. We're also joined by Dr. Anna Powles, who's senior lecturer in security studies, Center for Defense and Security Studies, Massey University in New Zealand. And we have Chris Hughes, professor of international relations at the London School of Economics. So I'm gonna hand over now to Cleo, who's going to kick us off. Hi. So I have sadly slides uh, to present. Can you see what have you got? What have you got up there? Nothing. There we go. So what I might actually do is go stand over there, if that's okay. So we've been using the term Indo-Pacific, and it's worth remembering that this area has been strategically dynamic for thousands of years, actually. So this is the Austronesian Empire, which stretched from about Madagascar all the way through uh, to Hawaii. Same language group, a lot of cross-pollination, and a lot of conquest along the way. That is essentially a map of the Indo-Pacific. This is a, a maritime domain that has been active for a very long time. And if you look more recently before the Europeans arrived, you'd have, say, the Lapita Empire, which was largely based around Tonga, so essentially a Tongan empire. These are thalassocratic empires, like, for example, the Greek empires where there were navies, there was strategy, there was conquest, there was intermarriage between population groups in order to create peace accords. It was not a uh, strategically neutral region. There was a lot going on. Into this region, in uh, about for real, the 19th century, came the Europeans. So you had, uh, this is a drawing from Punch from 1899, where you have poor Samoa being pulled by Germany, the United States, and the United Kingdom. And uh, uh, you had this kind of contestation going on for control over the region, but the region itself wasn't immune to its own internal conquests at the same time. It really, the region really came into our strategic focus during World War II. So this is a map of the region during World War II. The outer line is the extent of Japanese control. Every little red flash there was a major battle during World War II. It was a highly contested area. It was um, uh, extreme, some of the worst, most difficult pitched battles were in this region, including with the people of the region involved very directly. So if you go to, for example, Kiribati, which is kind of in the middle of there, you know, this is uh, in Butari Tari Lagoon. This is a downed, Japanese plane being looked at by US military officials. I went to Butari Tari. Every woman in Butari Tari still has one of these, which is a hair comb made out of the metal from that airplane. So they live with the relics of contestation and war on a daily basis. They're very knowledgeable generally about geostrategic issues. And they have been, over the course of their history, quite active in participating in it. So for example, Tonga signed a reciprocal security treaty with the US in 1886. Do we have the High Commissioner of Tonga here? I think we do. So this, the High Commissioner of Tonga is a direct descendant of King Tupo I, who uh, was one of the best geostrategists of the region. So you have people who for generations have known how to balance international powers in the region 
This is the coronation of His Majesty the King of Tonga, the High Commissioner's uncle. This is the Crown Prince and Princess of Japan. That's the Crown Princess of Japan bowing to the Queen of Tonga. They have deep strategic relationships which do not come up necessarily in the way that the West looks at the region. Okay? So what does it look like now? This is a map of the region including exclusive economic zones. We tend to think of them as small island states. Every little island gets a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone, which means they're actually very large ocean territories. And if you look at who owns what, you'll see, for example, everything that's blue belongs to France. These are not the powers that you normally think are in that area. Everything that's red belongs to the United States. The United States is not gone from this area. There is a little, little dot of light green. That's Pitcairn Island. That's the United Kingdom. So there is a lot of activity in that area that is uh, starting to ramp up in very new ways. The Chinese is the reason it's starting to ramp up. So China, as everywhere, is expanding its strategic reach. We'll be discussing that much more. The other presenters will discuss it much more than I will. But in response to that, there's been a great push again from the Western powers to engage in the region. Um, the background to it is in 2006, there was a sort of end of history syndrome. We won the Cold War. We don't need to be in these strategic outposts anymore. We're going to withdraw back to the metropolitan powers. Uh, the UK closed high commissions in the area um, and handed over strategic control to uh, New Zealand very overtly and to Australia and Melanesia. The problem is that there's been concern about China's influence not only in the Pacific Islands but in Australia and New Zealand themselves. And so you're starting to get the major European powers going back in in a way that we haven't seen before. There's concern that um, New Zealand, this, is, this may not be accurate, but just the fact that it's brought up is a problem from a Western perspective. If our potential allies in the Pacific are concerned about our frontline engagement, we have a problem, the general West. So the UK announced uh, very recently at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that they're going to reopen three new diplomatic missions in the Pacific, including in Tonga, Samoa, Vanuatu, two of which were closed in 2006. The reason is pretty overt to the people from the region. It's about China. It's also about post-Brexit and what the UK will be post-Brexit and how to um, leverage its relationship with the Commonwealth in the region. It's also about arms sales. So there's been announced a very big arms sale, well, frigate sale to Australia. Similarly, France, which we know has a very large footprint, has become re-engaged in a very big way. In fact, Macron is trying to push for an Indo-Pacific axis that includes Canberra, Delhi, and Paris because of the territories of French Polynesia and New Caledonia. We'll see whether that works. Um, but it's a, it's a para-EU foreign policy. This is a foreign policy that has nothing to do with the EU. This is France's foreign policy. Part of it also has been arms sales. Australia bought, said it would buy $40 billion worth of French submarines. That was the French minister, foreign minister at the time said that that meant that Australia and France would be married for the next 50 years, to which the Australians say we know what French marriages are like. <laughs> and there's already started to be some problems with the deal, and the Japanese have said, don't worry, we'd like to sell you submarines also. And this is part of this quad the, the Japan, Australia, India, US quad that's also developing in the region. There's a lot going on. The question is also about China in France in the Pacific. Okay? So the French Polynesian territories have seen a lot of Chinese investment. The French have dropped requirements for Chinese visa entries. They've allowed very large investments, including in an area that's an old French military base that has a military grade runway. And there are questions about whether those investments are strategic and whether the new French engagement, which is supposed to be counter China, is actually also letting in China through the back door. Okay. Very complicated dynamics going on in the region at the moment. And the people that are going to be front and center of those dynamics are the people of the Pacific. And they know what's going on. They've seen this for thousands of years. And so any strategic engagement that's going to be successful is going to have to include them. Thank you. Thank you.
And over to Anna. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to start. This, this, this talk is about, about strategic contestation in the Pacific, but I'm going to start by with a quote uh, from Dame Meg Taylor, who's the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, which is the preeminent political grouping in the Pacific Islands region. And a couple of years ago, she said in response to this amped up strategic concerns and anxieties in the region, she said the geopolitical and development context of the Pacific has shifted and the region faces a range of external and internal factors that are serving, acting to reshape it, increasing plurality of regional actors, shifts in global power and unmet development challenges. And this statement really captures the complexity and diversity within the region in terms of challenges and threats, but also the opportunities which are being sought. And as a consequence of recognition of these challenges, the Pacific Islands Forum and Pacific Island leaders are seeking to reshape the narrative and reshape the understanding around how to respond to challenges like China and others in the region. Because the Pacific, as Cleo has so um, adeptly uh, demonstrated, the Pacific Island countries are extremely uh, accustomed to negotiating and navigating a range of different actors and pressures in the region. And yet, despite that, Pacific Island countries are continuously portrayed as passive dupes, as lacking agency in their relationships with external powers and in their understanding of the geostrategic issues which are at stake here. That obviously is patently false and it's patronizing and it's something which uh, a number of the leaders, uh, such as Samoa's Prime Minister, Tuilepa, uh, and others throughout the region have continuously contested over the past year particularly. It's important <coughs> to keep in mind that even though we're talking about the Pacific as a whole, it is a diverse region. It is by no means homogenous. We have a range of different uh, uh, governments and cultures and uh, vast languages and so forth, as well as contested, uh, contested political authorities. We've got, we have two referendums coming up in the next uh, few years. New Caledonia, which will be voting for independence from France in a couple of weeks and Bougainville in likely to be held next year. So there's a great deal of contestation happening at the sub-regional levels as well. And we need to keep that in mind because as we think about the global, uh, the, geop the broader geopolitical challenges in the region, we need to think about how they interact with their sub-regional dynamics as well and what is driving what. So understanding this nexus between the regional dynamics and, and the current strategic contestation is incredibly important. Current strategic debates in the region, and I'm thinking particularly over the past year because it has ramped up significantly, have very much been concerned with the role of China in the Pacific. And that conversation is about the degree to which China is shaping the regional order and the degree to which they have influence and access amongst the Pacific Island countries. Current concerns about, about strategic contestation also reflect a growing uh, awareness that the sort of benign strategic neglect that uh, uh, as a consequence of Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the US all turning away from the Pacific as it no longer became a site of contestation of, of geostrategic importance. And the region's importance has long been measured in terms of whether or not uh, a threat will emanate from it or, or whether or not a threat will, will come across it. And that strategic vacuum has been filled largely by China, but also by other actors as well. The principal strategic concerns which center around China are very much in relation to what some will call it um, rent-seeking behavior uh, and the consequences and implications of that and the significant debt distress as a consequence. We can group, loosely group uh, China's in, uh, strategic intentions into um, three, uh, three categories. But keeping in mind that when we talk about China as well, just as we talk about the Pacific, it's by no means a homogenous uh, action that's taking place. It's increasingly centralized. But for a long time, we, we've recognized that there are, it, is, it is diverse and it is not necessarily joined up in any, situ any, any way. So the first is strategic influence. And a lot of that started around diplomatic competition um, between Taipei and, and Beijing. And because a third of um, Taiwan's allies are in the Pacific, around six Pacific Island countries recognize Taiwan, uh, that has been a, a key site of diplomatic competition. 
there have been real, very real consequences of that as well um, that I can discuss a little bit later. The second way that China seeks to um, secure a strategic influence is, is through uh, its aid program and the loan program uh, with the Pacific Island countries. It's the second largest donor in the Pacific, and, but six, uh, roughly around 67% of that is not direct grants, but actual loans themselves. And this has raised enormous amount of concerns about the ability of a number of Pacific Island countries to repay those loans. The third, uh, the second area is obviously is access to resources, and that has come as no surprise here, and particularly uh, in the context of fisheries and minerals. We've seen significant Chinese investment in the region, and that's, that's amped up significantly and been tacked on to the Belt and Road Initiative, which Papua New Guinea and uh, Niue, so talking about the largest Pacific economy and one of the smallest, have both signed up to the Belt and Road Initiative this year. New Zealand has as well, too, it's worth noting. Now, even though the Pacific is a comparative minnow um, economically uh, for China, when you think about its investments elsewhere, it's highly significant. The impact, the asymmetric nature of it and the impact that it has on the Pacific is quite significant. And we're likely to see that expanding significantly too. Papua New Guinea is really, has really been one of the main sites of um, that engagement. And here we've seen it's very much a, a test case in the kind of implications and consequences that Chinese investment has had, ranging from Chinese companies being able to influence the development agendas and, and infrastructure choices being made, through to the increased flow of non-conditional and commercial investment exacerbating uh, corruption and fiscal mismanagement, through to bolstering the political legi legitimacy of certain individuals or interest groups or parties, um, and right through to the uh, to landowner concerns and ecological concerns, and which is having a, a direct detrimental impact on communities um, in the Pacific. The flip side to that, though, is that Chinese investment has also bought much needed infrastructure, which hadn't been delivered beforehand. And that's where we need to keep that in mind, because that is directly relevant to uh, to Pacific perceptions of Chinese investment. Then, of course, there's the question around military access, and that's been ramped up quite a bit in the past year in terms of what that could potentially look like. Uh, there hasn't been anything significant uh, in terms of, of Chinese military uh, basing and so forth in the region. Um, 1987, a, they built a signals intelligence um, a tower in Kiribati, uh, which was quickly dismantled when Kiribati switched recognition to Taiwan. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fishing fleets, which are seen to be as a, a cover for a signals monitoring um, in the region. But apart from that, we haven't seen anything significant. But rumors of that and discussions around that have resulted in ramping up of Australian and American uh, engagement in this respect. So what does the Pacific think about all of this? And I'll just quickly, quickly talk about that for a second. As I said, large-scale Chinese investment has, uh, has opened up much-needed infrastructure. Um, for Pacific Island countries, and we see this across the region. And the competition has, is viewed as particularly healthy. Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister, Sir Peter O'Neill, made the statement about a month ago that it's healthy, that there are competing sources of finance uh, for infrastructure projects. And the competition between China, Australia, and the United States, leading to funds being made available to Pacific countries, is in the best interest of these countries and the region. So there's a slight... Uh, disjuncture between, between how the, cons the strategic anxiety is felt by Australia and New Zealand and other countries in relation to China and the way that the Pacific Island countries also view China as well as a, as a, as a, source, of, a source of much needed development and infrastructure. There's also a very strong perception amongst Pacific countries that they're being left out of these very important geostrategic conversations that are being had around the organizing of, the, of geopolitical space in the, in the region. And it's essential that, that Pacific countries are included in those conversations because it, they are already happening in the region. The Pacific Islands Forum is driving a lot of those conversations. But there again, there is a disconnect between what is being discussed in Canberra and Washington and elsewhere uh, and with what's being discussed in Suva and other capitals. Um, so I'll just quickly end with what New Zealand and Australia are doing in response to, in response to these concerns. Um, New Earlier this year, New Zealand announced its, its Pacific Policy Reset, which was launched uh, in February in 
um, Sydney, uh, the Lowy Institute. And this very much, the reset very much was uh, about anchoring New Zealand's identity as a Pacific nation, uh, as well as laying out a set of guiding principles, which were approved by Cabinet, to drive and to shape New Zealand's engagement with the region. And that came very strongly from a recognition that New Zealand was not doing as well as it should do in the region, that it's our relationships with our Pacific neighbours were not as strong as we thought they were and as they should be. And yes, of course, there was a strategic element to that in terms of New Zealand's national, national interest, uh, but it very much stems from a sense that New Zealand as a Pacific country needs to, needs to, to use the Australian term, step up and engage much better in a much more genuine way. By contrast, Australia's step-up policy, which was laid out in the foreign policy white paper at the end of 2017, has very much stems from a security imperative. And recommendations, included recommendations, that Pacific countries be integrated into New Zealand and Australian um, economic and uh, security institutions, into their spheres of influence, essentially. And these are very much at, um, at direct odds with uh, Pacific aspirations and priorities. So we see these quite different approaches, which are not necessarily competing um, by any stretch of imagination, but come to a problem in, in very different ways. So what is very clear here is that in regard, China is very present in the region. It's not going anywhere. It's been, in tra been involved in the region for a very long time. Um, we perhaps have just caught up to the, with the degree to which uh, it has, uh, has been engaged with Pacific Island countries. So the question for Australia and New Zealand particularly, and for other countries who are, who are becoming more involved again, such as the UK, is what, what strategies are needed to bind China uh, to positive outcomes in the region which are not, which are not detrimental to the Pacific agenda uh, and Pacific interests. And Pacific leaders themselves are calling for much greater coordination between China and, and, uh, and other leaders and other partners. So this kind of constructive multilateral binding engagement must obviously be underpinned by a very strong principled and value-based stance. And that's an area which New Zealand particularly is seeking to drive. And that's an area which we all need to be very cognizant of. Thank you. Thank you. And then over to Chris to expand a bit more in terms of the Chinese footprint in the region. Yeah, um, well, thank you. And um, I think if anyone here isn't aware of the diversity in the Pacific, they should get along to the Royal Academy's amazing exhibition on Oceania. So I recommend that. But I want to start off by just, I'm going to talk about China and what's happening there and the uh, implications of that for the Pacific. But first of all, this, this term, the Pacific, it does matter what, we, what the region is because the big strategic players uh, have different terms. China um, still talks about the Asia Pacific. They don't talk about the Pacific, so their strategy is based on the Asia Pacific. The US and Japan, the other two big players in the region, talk about the Indo-Pacific. The Japanese claim that they actually came up with this term, Abe, in his first administration, and I don't think the Americans would accept that. But they're obviously bringing India in as well. So you can see here on the big geopolitics, it really does matter what you mean by the Pacific and what it's linked to. Is India a player, for example? China certainly wants to resist that, of course, and wants to talk more about the Asia Pacific. But if we look at the um, longer term trajectory and we look at the Asia Pacific, then I think we've seen a big change in China's behavior over the last um, 10 years years, certainly since the financial crisis. Um, we used to think of China as characterized by these kind of demonstrations against Japan, for example, this high degree of public nationalism and activism. And you get these tensions <laughs> mainly within the first island chain um, running down from, through Japan to Southeast Asia. Uh, we don't see that now. Actually, Chinese nationalism seems to be much less salient but what we see is a much more systematic, well thought out, well disciplined strategy of salami slicing and using different forms of power, not just hard power, but combined with obviously economic power and also with um, cultural or soft power. I hate this term because it's certainly not soft, certainly when China uses it, but media power and so on, public opinion. Uh, and Behind that, whether that works or not, will depend very much on what's happening inside China because there have been these enormous structural changes to the Chinese political system and the military system. Um, last uh, year, 
um, the, uh, <coughs> they announced this big, sorry, it was earlier this year, this big change to the state council, the government system, shaking up all the ministries and so on. This gives Xi Jinping much more power. And of course, the big pattern is Xi Jinping concentrating power in his hands so he can use these different kinds of power much more effectively for pro projecting Chinese power overseas and pursuing China's interests. Um, back in 2013, they began the reform of the military, which has very big implications for the Pacific because the general picture is to reduce the size of the land forces, increase China's power projection. Uh, they launched their first homemade aircraft carrier last year. Um, it's not their first one, as you know, they've had this old Ukrainian aircraft carrier for, several, for, for many more years. But there's a lot going on there. The new ICBMs that they're developing, the Dongfeng 41s, which can hit the US within 30 minutes. This is all about power projection, and it means a lot of discipline and reorganization, sort of marshalling all the power that's built up under reform and opening, the latent power, and making it fungible into something that can be used in a kind of coherent, more coherent security and foreign policy, a strategy, which under Hu Jintao was kind of falling apart from the Chinese perspective, partly because of nationalists and renegades or whatever were sort of doing silly things and upsetting Japan or Southeast Asia without any real um, payback for that. Uh, and also the need to rein in those powerful private sector actors, the interest groups that are developed under reform and opening. This is one of the big power struggles in China, probably the biggest at the moment, of how to rein in the private sector and make it under the control of the Communist Party. So that obviously it goes back to what you were saying about Papua New Guinea and so on. You see these, one of the big problems for China's overseas presence, certainly in Africa, has been um, loss of control over state-owned enterprises, drilling for oil, extracting resources, and so on, and now also private sector companies. So she is trying to get control of those. And, you know, the idea is to have a more rational, more controlled foreign policy that seems to be getting out of control under Hu Jintao. So um, he has plenty of resources to do that because of China's economic growth, still at 6.5%. So although it's slowing, we know that. But please, you know, I don't think we should think about a collapse of the Chinese economy. Um, it's still growing. It's still very rich. Hard power, 8% rise in the defense budget this year, highest for three years. Long distance pro projection, as I've just said. I think there's another aspect to this. The types of power that are being developed are also very symbolic, the aircraft carriers and so on. And if you look at the Chinese media and how this is presented, certainly if you look at reports of UN peacekeeping operations and so on, it's very militaristic. And I think it's pretty clear that Xi himself identifies himself as a militaristic leader and wears military uniforms, has taken on the role of uh, commander in chief now. And this is important, I think, because we may not see so much of that uncontrolled mass demonstrations, nationalism that we saw in the 2000s, but we see a much more controlled kind of militaristic China developing. I think that's what Xi's vision is. So in, in that sense, it's more disciplined. And, and uh, you know, this is very typical, actually, of a rising power, as we've, as we've seen throughout history. But I think if you think about how this power is going to be used, it's useful to think in terms of concentric circles because you can learn a lot from the societies or the states that are at the cutting edge, um, such as Taiwan and Hong Kong and then Japan, and how this is spilling over and now into Australia and New Zealand and the Pacific Islands and so on. Um, if you look at Hong Kong, the combination where hard power is not important, but what is important is the use of... Uh, economic incentives and punishments to capture the elite. So we talk about elite capture, which I think is what people talk about in Australia now as well, and here probably, all over the world. Uh, that, you know, it's fairly easy to create this environment where people ha are very incentivized to do positive things that they think the Chinese will like, and then very disincentivized to go against that, whether they're business people or academics or government policy makers. Um, so it's important to bear that in mind because you can see in Hong Kong and also to a large degree in Taiwan um, where this really is, they like laboratories, where a lot has been achieved and China has very proactive policies to capture the elites, especially in Taiwan over the last couple of years since the election of the DPP government, to literally capture the best students, the best academics, the best scientists and win, bring them over to China's side. 
Um, even Japan um, has a very uh, impressive uh, Pacific strategy or Indo-Pacific strategy. But if you look at what's really happening in Japan, where their universities and most of their big corporations now rely on China, recruiting Chinese personnel to keep running, you, know, you see a totally different side to the picture, that the, power, the hard power really is not what's going to decide this. It's far more how China can, whether China can convert that economic power and the spread of its economic footprint into something that pursues its national interests. Should I go on? I could go on. Or, yeah. Um, so uh, I think this is why what's happening with the U.S. is the key to it and this economic uh, war between the U.S. and China. Uh, the Chinese see this, uh, the, the imposition of sanctions and so on, as a direct threat to the Communist Party. They see in particular access to their service sector as a threat because control of the financial sector by the Communist Party is really the bedrock of its support. And I think there are many in Washington who also see it that way, actually. This is not just about economics. Again, this is using economics to pursue a political strategy. So um, it's a kind of hard realism. The, the region, like the rest of the world, is now dominated by strong men leaders. Um, and there's a couple of strong women in the region as well. Um, but the big ones, so, you know, Xi Jinping, Abe, Trump, um, and so it's a very realist kind of scenario we're dealing with. And the economics is driven much more by geopolitics increasingly, which has a huge economic cost, I think. And that may be what decides the outcome, who can bear that cost the most. Thank you. Um, really a lot to kind of think through there, right? Because on the one hand, if, do you understand or see the region through the perspective of the Pacific Island? countries or if you then overlay that in terms of some of the sub-regional aspects or the geopolitics that are happening at the global level, some of which is new but as we've seen also has very long historical roots. Um, before we open out the floor for questions, one thing I'd like the panel to reflect on and perhaps share their thoughts is, you know, the UK, France, this re-engagement is very different to the Chinese approach that has been more sustained, more long-term, not bound by electoral cycles. So just to hear your thoughts on, you know, how do you see, or you're sort of thinking around, how do you perceive UK re-engagement in the Pacific vis-a-vis -vis China that has this much more long-term, much more sustained approach? And so, some of the challenges that that may then bring up. Yeah, so the, so the UK has, has announced these new uh, high commissions. They, they announced nine globally. All of them are in very small countries. Uh, the largest one is Lesotho, so it gives you an idea of, of uh, kind of the, the scope. Um, and, it, and it's part of this post-Brexit policy. So I see the, the engagement in, uh, in the Pacific as part of um, this post-Brexit shaping of a, of a foreign policy. Um, like many things with Brexit, um, the success or failure, I think, will depend on uh, commitment, foresight, strategic engagement, all, that, all those sorts of things. Um, if it's done halfway, um, it'll, it'll be a problem. So uh, there was discussion I, yesterday with Chatham House Rule, but I can use the information. So, so uh, we know, we heard yesterday that at least two of them might be co-locating with New Zealand uh, posts, which means that you'd have the British High Commissioner in a building that's owned by the New Zealanders. Uh, from a perception point of view, I don't think that's particularly helpful. My New Zealand colleagues may disagree. Uh, it basically makes the UK look like they're piggybacking on the New Zealanders, and any baggage the New Zealanders carry into that situation, the UK will carry with them as well. Um, and you'll be literally going for a meeting on the soil of, through the soil of New Zealand to get to the soil of the UK. So from a perception perspective, that's not great. If that's the nature of the way the, the, the engagement is going to be, um, I'm not sure how effective it's going to be. Um, the idea itself is very interesting and extremely useful because there is very little five eyes strategic coverage in many of these small countries, and that's where China gains a very quick foothold. So the idea behind that kind of engagement for the UK is is, I think, potentially extremely useful from a Western strategic perspective. It's going to depend on how it's uh, executed. I'll just, I'll just add to that in terms of um, if the UK w is serious about engaging with the Pacific Islands region through its three posts, regardless of where they're located, um, either with New Zealand or, or independently, uh, it needs to be serious about, about it. China has shown over and over again in the region 
that through very smart diplomacy, that um, building relationships, having language skills, which many Western diplomats lack in the Pacific. Uh, and, but if you, and if you go to, to the Marshall Islands or to, to anywhere else in the Pacific, by and large, the Chinese diplomats, a number of them will speak the, the um, local languages. And they have built relationships in a way that, that Western diplomats have failed to do so to the same degree. And I'm thinking particularly uh, of Australian and, and US, um, but also, uh, also others as well. So it's, it'll be imperative for the UK to think very strongly about, about who they're sending out to the region and to have some kind of sustained strategy because China has demonstrated over and over again that they are there for, invested for a long time in the region. Uh, and the Pacific is quite used to uh, powers coming in and out, other actors coming in and out of the region uh, and not really bringing anything tangible uh, to the region either. So it'll be critical to, to be much smarter about the way that it engages diplomatically. Quick. Yeah, well, I mean, it's nice we have a Japanese speaking foreign minister when he works out the nationality of his wife would be even better. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, I mean, this, you, you're all living here, you know what's going on. So um, global Britain, um, you know, where's the strategy? Where are the resources? What does it mean? Uh, I think the dilemma was summed up when we had this freedom of FNO, freedom of navigation um, uh, uh, through, um, we sent a ship through the South China Sea and the Chinese said, well, if Britain really wants a good trade deal with China, they better not do this again. You know, so that's the dilemma, and it goes back to that issue, what's really going to win this, the, these, these battles? Um, the British, half of the, you know, there's a small number of people, I think, in the British establishment who recognise the military significance of the South China Sea, the Pacific, Five Eyes, and so on. There's a much larger number of people who recognise or hope there are economic opportunities in the Belt Road Initiative, and that's where the dilemma is. So, and without a real strategy and real resources, uh, global Britain, we, we remain. You know, fill in the gaps, please. You know, let us know when, when you know what it means. But I think it seems what we're saying is, uh, oh, can people hear me okay? A, a, a smart form of diplomacy because we may not necessarily have the resources or the assets of a big country like America. So how do you do smart diplomacy where your starting point is what does the Pacific actually need? and then marry that to your own strategic interests, I think will be key. But let's open it out to our audience to see if you have any questions, thoughts. If you have comments, please keep them concise. Ideally, we want questions if possible, but over to you. Oh, here we go. If you could say your name, where you're from, if you want to. My name is Fedor Herbacek. My name is Fedor Herbacek. I'm a Chatham House member. Uh, one thing that has been absent from the resumes here is environmental issues. How do they come in and how do they influence that picture? Thank you. Let's take maybe the three questions on the front row and then we can open it out. But a very salient issue for the Pacific Islands, the impact of climate change. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one is about terminology. Um, sorry. Oh, so sorry, uh, Shireen Akina. And the area I deal with is Eurasia, specifically Central Asia, so a land-based uh, continent, and you're talking about a water-based continent, which chimes very well with the Royal Academy's exhibition, and that brings me to the point of uh, terminology. They use the term Oceania. Uh, you, I think, talked about Austronesia, and you, of course, reminded us of the uh, Japanese uh, term Indo-Pacific, and there are other terms too. Um, how would you prefer, individually, the three of you, uh, the region to be referred to? Second question, um, which may be beyond uh, this uh, group, um, institutionalization of relationships. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which started in Central Asia, but of course has spread way beyond, and there are Chinese Africa forums, Chinese Latin America, and so on. Um, is there anything for what I would call Oceania? And is there a matching type of institutionalization from the West or Western or members of the Western, whatever you like to call it? Uh, thank you. Thank you. And if we take the final question here, and then we'll hand over to the panel. 
Um, yes, in a similar vein, Hilda Rapp, uh, Centre for International Peace Building and a member of the uh, Chatham House. Um, I just ought to say that I spent the last seven years uh, travelling by sailing boat uh, to about 700 anchorages in the whole of the Pacific. Um, and so have had a privileged view of environmental issues, of economic issues, of governance issues. Um, and uh, I think you particularly have been sort of coining the sort of geo geostrategic, geopolitical, geological, uh, geographic and um, Geo. geophysical uh, kind of themes uh, where uh, I think, you know, uh, that creates a huge context for what the everyday life of people is like and, and how it is the Chinese, for instance, particularly, have managed to provide the most basic needs in the smallest places. If there is a shop, it's bound to be Chinese. And if it's in a bigger place, it's bound to have absolutely everything you could possibly need. Um, and these are sort of stealth kind of diplomacy that's been going on for many, many, many years and has obviously made a big, uh, uh, um, has influenced local people's perception of China hugely. There are hundreds and thousands of things I would love to ask, but I won't now. <laughs> Thank you. So over to the panel. I think if we start with the environmental question. So, so for the people of the Pacific, and, and Anna will talk about this more, is it's the key issue. In fact, we have a colleague from Fiji here who, who brought it up very forcefully that we're not taking those concerns seriously enough. It's a very fundamental issue in terms of food security, in terms of um, all, all, all the sorts of things that affect Pacific Islanders on a daily basis, which is why when you do your strategic analysis, you need to include geopolitics, geoeconomics, and geophysical change because you're potentially going to see population movements. And the three interact very strongly. So if you change the economic structures, you change the, uh, uh, we, we released a, a piece today about the potential effects of a free trade agreement on the region and how that might undermine food security in the context of environmental change issues. So it's very important. In terms of terminology, um, the, uh, so from a, again, this is just from a strategic perspective. So Asia Pacific is very much of a land-based conceptualization. Indo-Pacific is a maritime slash naval-based conceptualization, which is why P U.S. Pacific Command changed its name recently to Indo-Pacific Command, right? So there is a, a real push for the, you know, 20th century was the century of the Atlantic. 21st century, in terms of contestation, is being shaped more <coughs> as a naval issue, in part because of the economic aspects. A lot of the trade now is maritime based, so a lot of the concerns are in terms of uh, constraints of trade flows through the Pacific and through the Indo-Pacific, and we've seen China become a naval nation like it has never been in its entire history. So that's what a lot of the, the response is in terms of that uh, terminology. This issue of Chinese um, commercial, ground level commercial uh, is incredibly important. Um, we've talked a lot about China as a nation but the way that most Pacific Islanders uh, experience China is the guy who sets up the local shop and he can undercut the local Pacific Islander because he's getting his sources directly from his cousin back in China. So the um, uh, complete changing of the ground level economy in a lot of the Pacific Islands from the local shops through to who's getting access to the land through all that sort of stuff is, is very societally disruptive. And we've seen, uh, you know, we talk a lot about Ports, are, are ports dual use? Are, they, are the Chinese ports going to be, they say they're commercial, but are they going to be commercial military? And there's a lot of concern they're going to actually be triple use. They're going to be commercial, military, and criminal. So you get a lot of smuggling coming in, and within the Chinese community, in a place like Tonga, you're seeing human trafficking, murder, like stuff you've never seen in these societies before. And they, uh, it starts to pull in Pacific Islanders who may not have jobs into that kind of uh, a society. So it's incredibly disruptive. So that, at, and at the ground level, you're starting to see a lot of anti-Chinese actions. You've seen riots over the last few years and targeting as well. So when you're talking about China, there are a lot of different Chinas. There's state level China, there's commercial China, there's criminal China. There's, so, so it's worth disaggregating if you're trying to figure out what's the most disruptive for the people of the region versus what's the most disrupt, disruptive for the strategic interests in the region. Just to add to that, I mean, that kind of transnational illicit economies is not unique to China. You see this in other kind of areas of the world that are developing. So I think it's a broader question of the illicit economy and the spaces that open up that allow things like drug trafficking, human trafficking, et cetera, which is not solely a sort of, you it, know, it, it's yeah. The Pacific Islands, the societies are so small mm -hmm. that you can see it really, really clearly, and it's, and it's predominantly linked to newly arrived Chinese, not the Taiwanese Chinese, not the Chinese who've been there for 100 years, but this sort of newly arrived population. 
Anna? Uh, just on the environmental issue side, uh, it's worth noting that in the, um, the last Pacific Islands Forum communique that came out for the meeting that was held in, in uh, a couple months ago in Nauru, they identified climate change as the single greatest threat to the Pacific Islands countries. And it's been a, a, a point of frustration amongst Pacific leaders and activists and civil society and the church and so forth that there has been a reluctance on the part of the Pacific Island country partners, including Australia, uh, less so New Zealand, but others as well, uh, that they have not recognised the importance of climate change as being the fundamental threat. And as a consequence of that, there was a push uh, by the Pacific Islands Forum to expand the concept of security in the region, to incorporate environmental insecurity and climate change being one, but also extending that out to disaster response, humanitarian relief and so forth, and the impact on human security as a consequence of that. So no discussion about security in the Pacific can be divorced from climate change because it is the fundamental risk and it is the area where the Pacific Island countries have taken global leadership on and, uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, in terms of framing the region, uh, and you asked what preference we would have to, and what we call it. As far as the Pacific Islands is concerned, the Pacific Islands region encapsulates uh, the 22 states and territories that comprise that region. But there's been a reframing of it in terms of, and this is a, this is, this draws from, there's a, a Tongan philosopher called Apeli Hoafa who talked about the relationship between peoples and oceans and the importance of not thinking about smallness in terms of small atolls or small, small island states, but rather largeness because of the Pacific Ocean being one of the largest oceans. And this idea of large ocean states as opposed to small states. And so this broadening out in terms of, and that captures to the um, role that the Pacific is taking in terms of ocean governance and this blue Pacific identity. So again, it's expanding out this notion of who Pacific Islanders are uh, and the relationship between oceans and the region as a whole. So it's a take a slightly, taking a slightly different approach to it. Um, in terms of Chinese businesses, yes, I'm glad that uh, Cleo made the, made the distinction between the old and new Chinese because it's a fundamental distinction within the Pacific. And of course, you know, in terms of capturing local small economies, that's obviously a significant concern. And we've seen an increase in targeting uh, through Papua New Guinea, uh, in Tonga, uh, and the Solomon Islands of targeting Chinese communities, often distinguishing as well between those old and new um, Chinese communities who frequently do not actually get along because there is frustration amongst the old Chinese that the new Chinese coming in are bringing practices and behaviours which reflect very badly on them and that they are... They, they are uh, impacting the name of the, the good name of, of those Chinese who have become well um, integrated into societies, married, uh, taken up um, citizenship, speak languages and so forth. So it's quite an important distinction, but it's going to raise more and more questions. And one of the one of the issues that is thought about a lot in in Australia and New Zealand and in the Pacific is with a much more, a far more assertive China, at what point will they uh, deploy, as they did uh, during in the Solomon Islands in 2006 with the riots in Chinatown, at what, what point will they deploy a much more assertive force to extract Chinese if an incident occurs uh, in one of these countries? And that is something that is talked about a great deal uh, in Australia and New Zealand, um, because obviously it is uh, of paramount concern because the potential for, for, for things to go wrong uh, will be, could be quite significant. Chris? Yeah, well, thank you for raising the issue of the environment. We should have mentioned it before. I mean, if you look at um, certainly in Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy, and if you take the Belt Road Initiative as China's strategy, they both do address the environment actually in very big ways. They talk about sustainable development and so on. Um, the US uh, at the moment, uh, under its current president, I should say its green credentials are not the strongest. <coughs> um, so there, I think there is a real issue there, whether that will undercut some of the at least expressed intentions of the other two big powers, Japan and China, to try to address these issues um, while they're taking forward their strategies. But on the other hand, we shouldn't, you know, we should recognize that the uh, small states do have quite a lot of leverage over environmental issues. If you think back to Copenhagen, 
um, the, the, the climate conference at Copenhagen. That was the big turning point for China's uh, approach to the environment and development because it was hijacked essentially by some island states that were sinking underwater. And so it made China, the Chinese could no longer say we're representing the developing world. And so they had to rethink. And you can see that in the Belt Road Initiative. Um, now, how do you build on that? Because, of course, you can't assume that what's written on paper is what's done in practice. But by engaging with, this was one of the big political decisions, whether or not to engage with the Belt Road Initiative. And I think most states have, with the exception of the US and Japan. Um, and that has, I think the, the, the judgment at the moment is that that, has, that that engagement has helped China to raise its environmental standards on sustainable development. It's been a good experience that can be built on. So, I would, you know, I want to inject a positive note before we leave here, because I think that is positive. On the other issues of the, um, the Chinese presence on the ground at the grassroots, it goes back to that issue, I think, of, you know, is this planned or is this just out of control or is it somewhere in the middle? Because this is, these are not all things that are controlled from Beijing. These are people who are seeking opportunities. As has been mentioned quite rightly, criminal networks is a huge issue for China as well. And so, again, there's an issue of cooperation with China. It's in China's interest to cooperate. Um, and that, again, involves some difficult political decisions on whether to repatriate criminals to China, for example. Um, so, uh, but I think, you know, that, that when we look at China and we see Xi's attempt to consolidate power, it reveals a kind of fragility and loss of control that's happened over this increasingly pluralistic and complex society that, that has a footprint everywhere here as well as the Asia Pacific and who is acting on whose behalf that's very hard to work out. Thank you. I'm going to take because well, we're kind of running out of time almost but if we take these two questions from the front row they're there but maybe if you take a question each to respond to so if we'll take these three questions and then one will divvy up. Beard and Sharon. So uh, my name's Carl Nash, I'm the Acting Deputy High Commissioner for Australia. Um, I just wanted to respond to a couple of the points. Um, Is it possible to frame as a question and a well, short one? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued as to why you say there's been a benign strategic neglect, uh, Dr. Powers, because um, we're the largest aid provider to the Pacific with $1.3 billion a year. Um, in terms of climate and environment resilience, we're, we're putting $300 million uh, into that in the, into the Pacific. Yes, we have a different form of assistance into the Pacific. Um, we we put a lot of stress into effective governance, which is nearly one third of the money that we put into the Pacific, um, education and health. So we don't focus as much in infrastructure as other countries, although one fifth of our aid spending in the Pacific is focused on infrastructure and trade. But um, from the Australian perspective, we don't feel as if we've, we've ever left the Pacific. Yes, other countries are now more interested in it, but we've always been there. We've always, um, you know, and, and uh, we've always had the Pacific because it's our backyard as a focus of it. Um, so I just wanted to, to raise those points. I'm, I'm intrigued, um, Ms Pascal, about the comment that um, if the regional FTAs would undermine food security. I mean, from our perspective, um, regional FTAs are really vital in ensuring that Pacific Island countries participate in global value chains. Um, if they trade, then they can benefit from trade, and if they can facilitate that trade and, and attract foreign direct investment, then their economies will grow and their people will become wealthier. That's why we instituted the Spartica um, regional FTA, when Spartica wasn't working anymore, that's why we, we instituted PESA Plus, so that Pacific Island countries could join into global value chains and become wealthier and not rely upon development assistance from other countries, but take their rightful place as some of the wealthiest countries on the planet with all the, the natural resources they have. Thank you. So I think it's important to then respond to these concerns. I'm just wondering if people are OK for us to run slightly over. We could take these last two questions. Robert Foster, a member. I'd be interested to hear your comments on the impact of technology on um, between the uh, consumers who are getting on islands, increasing numbers of mobiles, no doubt, 
and the influence of, you know, from the US, you know, the fangs, the Facebook impact, and the Chinese, you know, very strong competition in that area, you know, who's winning the influence battle through the new technologies, and is Europe having any impact at all? Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Julia Bugliese, King's College London. I'm interested in the specifics of uh, collaboration between uh, Australia, the US and Japan. We have announced uh, a memorandum of understanding for infrastructure building. Um, and to what extent do you see policy banks and how will policy banks from these three countries or development agencies um, practically work in the Pacific in terms of cooperation in the infrastructure building? Because I see, like Global Britain and whatnot, as mentioned earlier, I, like, I, see, I hear lots of rhetorics, but so far the uh, announcements have been rather underwhelming. Thank you. Thank you, and that may be something that we can draw in some of our Australian colleagues on as well. Um, well, there's a feast there, so perhaps if we do quick responses and we can follow up with people perhaps after. So uh, I would love to talk to you in great detail about the problems of Pacer Plus. We published a thousand word piece on, on the problems today and why I think it'll affect food security. Um, in part, um, the, a lot of food security now is provided by customarily held land. So the land is distributed through a non-capital economy based way throughout the entire society. You privatize the land, the food gets exported out through your value chain and then there's much less food available through the families domestically. They need to earn money in order to buy it, and a lot of the food that they have to buy is the dumped Australian and New Zealand food because those free trade agreements give Australia and New Zealand a most favored nation status uh, entry into the region that forces, for example, Tonga not to buy from Fiji, but to buy from Australia and New Zealand where the food is more expensive and poor quality. So we can go into much greater detail about that. I'd love to. I'd love to talk to my colleagues about why I think this is a security issue because I think you're walking into a mistake that's also opening the door for Chinese uh, engagement through Pacer Plus into critical infrastructure through Australian New Zealand based companies with Chinese backed money that'll be able to use that cover to gain access to ports, telecom and other critical infrastructure. I think but it's a problem. Let's continue that nice yeah. plug for the piece we released today. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to just respond to your question about Australia's strategic neglect or not of, of the Pacific. Um, Australia has been inconsistent over the past three decades in terms of its engagement. And whilst I completely acknowledge uh, the amount of money that Australia has poured into the region, money doesn't mean everything in the Pacific. It's about relationships. and. Australia has consistently dropped the ball in relation to its relationships. Australian prime ministers have not attended foreign, minister, um, foreign leaders meetings. Uh, policy was, has, was delegated certainly to the last, um, to the last uh, foreign minister, to Julie Bishop. Uh, she led Pacific policy by and large. These things matter. There have been numerous examples over the year where over the years where Australian inconsistency towards the region has impacted significantly on its ability to retain the kind of influence that you would think that Australia would have because of the amount of money it's pouring in. A case in point is with the Solomon Islands when Australia discovered that the Solomons was discussing with Huawei the um, development of um, the, um, communications cables and a lot of the commentary that came out of Canberra at the time from analysts and others was Australia had just poured in, I can't remember the exact figure, an enormous amount of money as part of the regional assistance mission. Uh, and why therefore was, this, was they not, why, why therefore was the Solomon Islands not, not uh, heeding Australia's uh, concerns around, around Huawei? And consequently, um, Australia was able to then to, to maneuver that deal and and, uh, and out, um, out a flank Huawei in that respect. Um, and that raises a whole lot of issues in, in relation to that. But by and large, it has been inconsistent in terms of policy and has missed the mark repeatedly. And certainly Papua New Guinea is case in point of that. Uh, and, and that even in the, on the news a couple of days ago with, um, with uh, the defence, um, with the commander coming out in relation to the discussions around bases, uh, Australian bases at Lombrum and rebuilding um, Lombrum and other, other um, discussions around that has been, demonstrates that there is a real 
missing the mark in terms of the way that Australia is engaging. And certainly back through the 1990s and, and early 2000s, that came through over and over again. And it's interesting that there's a survey that's going to be um, conducted later this year um, from ANU, which is looking, which is called the People's Survey, similar to what used to be run in the Solomon Islands under Ramsey, which is going to be looking at perceptions across the region of Australia. So I think that will be quite important to capture uh, perceptions around the region of, of, of Australia. But again, it comes back to relationships. Money does not mean everything. It's relationships, and that's where Australia has failed, unfortunately. I feel like this part of the conversation could go on for some time, and it'd be actually fantastic to follow up with you on that. But if we just briefly pick up, there was the technology point and around US, Japan, Australia collaborations. Perhaps if I can give Cleo, the opportunity. Chris, did you want to come in on the technology question? Perhaps if we take the technology question now and we take your question offline. So very quickly, that's a very important question, particularly around Facebook. So these are extremely tight-knit communities where people's opinion of each other matter a lot. And you're starting to see uh, uh, the, the, the most, in some cases, as with every country in the world, some of the nastiest elements of society using anonymous Facebook pages to knock out potentially good political competitors, for example. So it was a big issue in the recent election in Tonga, where certain factions used Facebook to destroy like, the families of people who wanted to run for politics. So it's, it's, a, it's because of the nature of these societies, how tight-knit they are, the anonymization of information, personal information, that can run through something like Facebook has been incredibly destructive. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm sure we could continue the conversation more, but we do have a follow-up, not follow-up event, but our next event is tomorrow at the Royal Academy in the evening. But please do stay in touch with Chatham House because this is a region we're interested in. We will be publishing more commentary analysis on this, and we hope to see you